Good afternoon. Welcome back to the third chunk of the Hot Topic session. This will be a plenary debate, so there will be a lot of time to uh, do question and answers and any comment and remark uh, that you may want to do. Uh, but let us first start with a brief round of summaries of the results of the workshops that uh, some, a group of young researchers will, will carry on. And the first one will be uh, Abdul Wasai, a PhD student in data systems at the Harvard School of Science and Engineering in the US, who will report on the um, workshop by uh, Megan Price, Big Data Promises and Pitfalls, Examples from Syria. So there will be these five short reports, and then we will open the debate. Please, Abdul. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the workshop Big Data Promises and Pitfall, which was uh, led by Megan Price. Uh, so here it goes. Uh, in a world which is absolutely obsessed with big data and the promises uh, and the mythical salvation that it brings to almost all dimensions of human life, our workshop was focused on the application of big data in, uh, for human purposes, especially in areas where data collection is not that robust and it's hard to find uh, good data sources. So in these cases, uh, data is not only big, not necessarily fast, but is inherently incomplete. What this means is that you have incomplete data on one side, which might not even be in digital form, which might just be papers, images, uh, Xerox copies. And what you're trying to do is uh, you're trying to pass it through some sort of pipeline and get information out of it and use this information for accountability purposes. For example, in the case of Syrian violence, what you want to do is you want to document uh, sort of victims, and then uh, eventually when hopefully the dust settles, you can hold uh, parties accountable for it. So uh, we started off with a presentation uh, by Megan Price, and among other things, uh, Megan's presentation focused on how to tell a statistically complete, sound, and correct story from multiple incomplete sources. It focuses on Syria as a case study, and uh, I'm just going to quickly move on to a few conclusions that we withdrew uh, from, from this particular session. The first one is that data is mostly, in these cases, uh, very frequently incomplete, and it has collection biases. Quantitative analysis can contribute to human right accountability, but it has to be correct and right. The major challenge that uh, any search effort faces in the modern world is to prevent data and technology from telling an incorrect and wrong story. And the last uh, but not the least was uh, in data science world, uh, which is increasingly obsessed with technological innovations, there is need to introduce uh, formal statistics so that when we end up telling stories uh, from these human right data sets, it's, uh, they're not, not only are, there, are they um, in some ways meaningful, but they're absolutely correct because they have very real um, implications in the real world. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Abdul. And now let me call on stage Brian Davis, a master's student at the Department of Statistics and Operations Research at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the US, who will report about uh, Peter Ryan's workshop, Backdoors, Trapdoors, and Crypto Wars. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, my voice is a bit hoarse, so forgive me. I am very grateful for the opportunity to have yeah, uh, argued politics in a castle last night, but it did leave me a little bit hoarse. Um, during Peter Ryan's discussion, we had a, an opportunity to gather a nuanced perspective, um, and I think nuance is a really key word. It's very interesting, and, um, and he encouraged us to consider both sides of what Big Brother uh, really means. Um, and by that, I mean that we had to recognize that intelligence and law enforcement form and uh, carry out a really important role in society, um, but that their unconstrained uh, use and their unconstrained power and lack of oversight, obviously, can be very dangerous for civil society. Um, so one of the sort of most fundamental aspects of that sort of balance is to recognize that Complete transparency 
uh, a world in which we have complete oversight over uh, the NSA and all of its activities and CIA and whatnot fundamentally undermines their mission. Um, and that is something that we must take into account when we uh, consider this sort of balance uh, of protection, open sea, transparency, and things like that. Um, throughout his talk, Peter Ryan gave us a history of the sort of balance of power within the United States in particular. Um, the two uh, the crypto wars, one and two. The initial battle during the Clinton administration in the 1990s to, for the government to have front door access to a lot of cryptographic things. So basically having a uh, key by which they could open up the messages that they saw the need to open up. And then after that legally failed and technically failed, um, the sort of crypto wars too, which you could say that we're still in the trenches. Um, in particular, the crypto wars too has been uh, sort of the kind of front lines have been um, in cryptography itself and in the standards in the United States and the attempts by the NSA to undermine those standards, um, in particular through the dual elliptical curve, uh, random, num random number generator, uh, but also several other things. Um, so it's clear that in terms of this balance, um, the, there has been a balance that's very been much been in favor of Big Brother, um, and that now we're in the process of finding out how and what the best ways are to go forward in terms of correcting that balance as a society. Um, and we came up with a few, uh, we, Peter Ryan suggested a few uh, ideas that had come from his recent um, discussions, and we also had a few uh, thoughts that came up uh, in, during, the during the discussion following his presentation. Uh, the first one that I thought was very interesting was the idea of employing some of the uh, most recent cryptographical results that we heard about, um, I believe, two days ago, zero-knowledge proofs. So the idea of the, um, without actually needing to see that surveillance was according with certain rules that we could prove, that we could somehow abstract, make that idea more abstract to prove that surveillance was, was, was occurring within certain bounds. Um, because obviously we cannot reveal the necessarily the information or the targets of that, but we could somehow come up with a way to verify that those targets are appropriate. Um, another, way, another idea was to have a verified limit on the percentage of communications that surveillance agencies have access to and for there to be technical enforcement and technical limitations on the amount of communication that people have access to to prevent the sort of catch-all that we saw um, in the, uh, in, 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 in the most recent regime. Um, another thing we do, other than technical, uh, technical innovations, is also to consider social innovations, such as making it safe for whistleblowers and setting up systems by which whistleblowers can reveal information, and perhaps even a treaty, a Magna Carta of the Internet, in which we sort of declare a new standard about the way that the uh, surveillance practices take place. During our discussion, we could not help but talk about the double-edged nature, nature of cryptography itself, we also talked about quantum computers and the threat to standard RSA encryption brought, uh, brought by the potential, uh, potential quantum computing. We threw out terms such as liquid democracy, um, which was the idea of making, uh, which was related to the idea of uh, making, uh, uh, making the uh, surveillance accountable uh, in some way to democracies in a, techni in a, in a technical way. Um, and finally, we just talked about the complexity of dealing with situations like this in a situation where intelligence agencies, it's not just one big brother, but it's many big brothers. And it's many big brothers that are having inter-big brother rivalries with each other. Um, and how the international political context makes all of this far more complicated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian, and let us now move to Yusra um, Ibrahim, a PhD student in Information Retrieval and Extraction at the Max Planck Institute for Informatics in Germany. Um, hello, everyone. So I will report on uh, um, Chero uh, workshop about black boxes. So in the era of big data, we are uh, tracked by black boxes. So places we visit, people we interact with, uh, what we like, um, what we say and our behavior and even our heart rate. So everything is tracked using black boxes like mobile devices, um, fitness trackers, or sometimes GPS uh, boxes which can be inserted in your car uh, for the insurance company to know how to, how to detect your driving behavior and charging you accordingly for, 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 for your driving behavior. 
Um, so then this big data is fed into another black box, which is a machine learning black box. Uh, this can categorize us under different profiles, make predictions or assign us a, a score on a certain scale. So big data is receiving more attention. Of course, it has many applications, but it also have uh, some drawbacks. So in our workshop, we, we, we targeted some of problems of machine learning black boxes. Uh, the first, we brought up the issue of how data is collected and sampled to infer mathematical models that can be used to calculate or predict uh, unknown values. Um, then we discussed how to validate the accuracies of uh, the inferred model, or in other words, how to ensure the correctness of the decision uh, that come out of these black boxes machine, uh, learning machines. Um, after this, we turned to the hidden parameters used to score um, user behavior in order to make critical decisions about, for example, specifying the amount of, of money to charge for a person car insurance, um, or deciding whether to grant a credit to a person or not. We discussed how learning algorithms can make decisions that are, some, are, are sometimes hard to explain, and that is, we need more transparency. So these black boxes need to be transparent somehow for the public to understand what are the parameters they are being scored upon and how they can improve their score, for example. Um, however, there is another perspective that transparency may result in systems that is more vulnerable to um, deception. Um, moreover, it may create some competition between different, for example, insurance companies. So we need some sort of controlled transparency. Um, then we expose the biased and discriminative fa face of big data. So we may think that machines do not have biases, but in, in fact they do have. Um, so for example, um, they can favor the majority group over the minority group since they are biased towards the, the, the more representative sample. Um, you, I mean, the more representative, the representative sample that is used to build the original mo model for training the machine learning model. Um, so uh, a machine learning algorithm is considered to be accurate if it, if it produces accurate predictions for the majority group, regardless of how nasty it is in predicting, um, like maybe the scores of the minority groups. Um, because the, the error in the minority group is always negligible. Uh, thus, we need to find new ways that prevent machine learning algorithms from being biased. Never, nevertheless, this may require uh, the identification of some um, of the minority groups, which is non-trivial, non um, because the minority classes are sometimes fuzzy. Um, moreover, this may need to expose some of the demo demographics um, which should be protected like ethnicity or religion. So eventually we concluded that uh, the algorithmic decision-making um, black boxes uh, is the most critical and controversial topic. So it has to be addressed by bridging between different communities to find a collective solution. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let me open the debate. Um, as I said at the beginning, there is this idea or, the, or this association of big data with the concept of omnipotence, of a level of penetration in human life that, I don't know, Stasi would have dreamt of. But at the same time, in your talks, you have highlighted that there's plenty of false positives, biases, mistakes in the processing. So aren't we maybe overestimating the power of big data? Uh, yes, actually, sadly, I think that we are, and even though I give the positive aspects of it, um, not only do we have missing data and, uh, um, you know, or incorrect data, but in some cases we even have data that's been manipulated in some way, uh, falsified, in fact. Uh, so it's important really to triangulate resources, but one of the things um, I think that was one of the critical premises of Jim Gray's work was that you always have to have a subject matter expert involved. And as, as a statisticians and as uh, computer scientists, it's really our responsibility to make sure that we don't leave the science out of uh, big data. Uh, that's the critical piece, I think, that would be missing. Any other comment on the buzzword big data or its 
omnipotence or not. <laughs> I mean, I think it depends on what you're talking about by overestimating the power. If you're, if you're talking about overestimating the power it has over people's lives, uh, I don't think we're overestimating that. We may be overestimating how, how accurate or how successful it is, and that'll depend on any given situation uh, or how it's implemented. But certainly, I think it's definitely the case, and it's only going to get more so the case, that, it has a, that data has a huge impact. Uh, I mean, there are now uh, states in the United States where sentencing guidelines are being set by data. Uh, so this is determining how long someone goes to jail based on statistics. Not, you know, and, you know, so I, I'd say that's a lot of power for data mm -hmm. to have. Okay. And on the other hand, when, when science models a phenomenon, usually the objective is not only understanding it, but also kind of modifying it in some way. Um, there is this concept of behavioral nudging that has appeared in several talks. What do you think? I mean, is it just a myth or is it something that is ongoing or may be ongoing in, in the future? I, I would say it's something that has been going on in, in simpler forms for a much longer time in the domain of marketing, right? They use a socio-demographic data to segment uh, a population and selectively target uh, is, uh, is established. So the, the fact that now we have different behavioral signals that allow us to measure and quantify other behaviors only allows us to add new features to our models and to segment in a higher dimensional space. So we, we can refine more and more the, the, the segments of population which are no longer purely socio-demographic. They can be hinged on, uh, on other variables, possibly latent variables that are redundantly encoded. In the, in the available features, and, and this can be used and is used for targeting. And, and the, the big question to me there is that the moment we have more and more computer science in the loop of society in the form of algorithmic decision making, we need to start reasoning by using the same conceptual tools and the same normative uh, uh, instruments that the public health community and the biomedical community developed for a long time in order to deal with the same problems. So, the problems are really the problems of a data-intensive approach to decision-making, which now, however, is in the loop of many products and services. That, uh, and so it's important that uh, we, we inform this uh, with, in the best interest of the citizens while preserving business competitiveness. So it's kind of extending the public health traditional vision to a much broader field. To the idea of having a lot of computer science techniques in the loop of products. Yes, please, Alessandro. Uh, following up on uh, Chiro's comments, <coughs> when we reveal in, uh, information about ourselves, uh, we are not just revealing um, our preferences uh, um, or likes, we are in fact also revealing uh, psychological traits, uh, uh, cognitive biases that uh, for parties could potentially use to, in fact, influence us. So the more we reveal, the more we are also sharing with others uh, the, the buttons that they have to push in order to direct us in a certain direction. M my belief is that, um, to bring back to the discussion to my field, economics, uh, what is currently known as targeted advertising will become something more, and perhaps is already becoming something more, as uh, the focus will no longer be necessarily matching the product to the consumer, which is targeted advertising. I know that you like shoes, these particular shoes, I'll show you an ad for these shoes. But actually using personal information to change on the fly the advertising message so that it speaks specifically to you. For instance, from your Facebook profile, I may know who your girlfriend is or what kind of songs you like. And I may use the information in an ad in a very uh, um, inotrosive manner. Because if, if I go forward and I show a photo of your girlfriend, you will be freaked out. There will be what marketing people call reactance. You actually become angry with the company which is doing this to you. But if you do it in a subtle way, such as you morph the face of the girlfriend with the face of a spokesperson, and you create a facial composite, or you use uh, some song which reminds you, part, reminds part of your brain of a song that you really like. Now you're using personal information to influence behavior in a manner which is nearly undetectable. And this is quite worrisome. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very interesting that, I mean, you must do it in a way that is not so explicit as putting your girlfriend's picture, because otherwise this, okay. And um, now taking advantage that we have such a wonderful, talented uh, public of young researchers, I would like to ask you what scientists can do for this. So let me kind of give you a Gedanken experiment. So you are 
you have one of these talented young researchers on top of a hill and you are running and when you get on top of the hill you have only one last breath to tell him or her what he or she can do to somehow contribute or improve to these situations. What would you say with your... <laughs> in a very <laughs> short and summarized way, what would be your advice, what would be the priority of, I mean, of, of for a scientist to give a contribution to this uh, debate? It's a difficult one, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I think I would say don't, don't do something trivial. I think it's too easy to fall in love with a model. It's too easy to fall in love with a, a data set. And it's really, you know, one of the beautiful things is uh, being able to, to do something that's, that's really meaningful for society. And uh, so um, there's tons of data out there. And yes, it can be used for evil, but it can also be used for good. So I would say be a force for good. And I, I want to be on the hill right, right behind because I second that completely, but I also want the next sentence to be, don't do it naively, because um, I think that that's also sort of a corollary to that. It's really easy to be so enamored with new technology and new methods that you might sort of forget some of the earlier steps, like where did that data come from and how was it collected? So absolutely do something good, um, but continue to be just as smart and insightful and curious as you already are. And, and if I may add to that, another, another key point, I believe, is really not to get framed into a vertically defined community. Uh, as you see, and as, a, as was apparent in many of the, the discussions we had today, a lot of the challenges that we are facing uh, entail technical aspects, societal aspects, normative, normative aspects at the same time. And no single community has got the tools and the solutions and is capable and empowered to, to come up with solutions. So we need to, we need to reason in, uh, in terms of, uh, of establishing dialogues so that force us to, to speak many different languages in terms of disciplines in order to, to unlock the values of what we can technically empower. That's great. So maybe I would open the debate to the public if you have any question or comment or remark. Otherwise I could go on for hours, but uh, <laughs> it's better not. So hi, uh, I think there are two things that I would like to comment on. That um, first, you use the service because of it. if people tell you not to use Google tomorrow, you'll probably use it. I mean, the chances are very slim that any of us will just quit Google as researchers. Um, and then there is another thing, which is the, an ethical issue in how we publish studies. There are some studies, for example, done by Facebook. They, they have a, a long track record in tracking their users and manipulating their, uh, their emotions. Uh, but still, this was published in, uh, in very reputable places. And then there is a question for scientists. Are we supposed to publish this? Uh, these kinds of studies that were done without the consent of the users and that actually manipulate the uh, state of the users. Thank you. Okay, so anybody who wants to answer or comment, please understand. Um, I can start. I, I would like to comment on both, but th th there are both beautiful and, and very important questions, so I'll, I'll focus on the first. Um, you, you, you point out something very important. Uh, th there are these, uh, again, economists call them trade-offs, costs and benefits associated with using certain services which provide a utility but they may also bring up privacy cost. And my, my view on this is that it goes back to something we were discussing during the previous session which is uh, we are putting individuals into this uh, 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 impossible to solve dilemma uh, where they have to decide by themselves um, how much to use these systems uh, without actual knowledge of uh, what the real privacy cost is because uh, we actually don't know any longer how the data is being used, uh, with how many parties is being shared and so forth. Um, I was advocating policy solution because uh, the, the, the cost benefit trade-off is very difficult for each individual um, person to, to resolve. There is something called a privacy externality, which is uh, the cost imposed on you by others' uh, um, usage of the service. For instance, nowadays it would be very difficult for a teenager not to be on, uh, on Facebook or not to be on Twitter, uh, because it's part of the normal social life to interact through those systems. And if you are not on those systems, 
because of privacy reasons, you are probably going to miss out on uh, social events. And this is a huge cost to impose on a single individual. That's why I, I go back to uh, societal and policy solutions rather than in, uh, pure individual decision making. Anybody else want to comment on this? No? So well, I, was say, I can uh, address the second part. I mean, obviously, Facebook should be able to publish whatever it wants to publish. But I, think, I do think we as researchers have a moral obligation uh, not to encourage that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's like we talked about earlier. There's, there, when you start as a computer scientist doing experiments on people, you have to start thinking about the fact that you're dealing with flesh and blood living human beings the same way that you know, you're not going to necessarily cause someone to get sick and die the way you might with a, a medical experiment, but you can have effects. And so I think we as a society need to encourage uh, essentially this sort of code of conduct uh, you know, what Facebook did would never have flown at a university uh, unless it had first gotten, uh, you know, past the human review board. Well, uh, just to summarize, if anybody is not aware of the Facebook oh, yeah. thing, yeah, it was basically an experiment implying the manipulation of the mood of the Facebook user without them knowing it. So it was, it was scientifically very relevant, but also very controversial on the ethical side. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think we should be encouraging those sorts of things to, to pass some sort of review uh, before we publish. And, and they do exist indeed for academia. So in, in the United States, in order to do these kind of experiments, you need approval by something called IRB, Institutional Review Board. So you can uh, run experiments with manipulation, but under appropriate safeguards. The, the, the loophole is that the industry is not currently, uh, is not supposed to abide to uh, these uh, um, um, regulations and therefore uh, even just using a terms, uh, consent to a terms, terms of service uh, that I may have agreed uh, three years ago when I created my Facebook account is considered three years later as implicit consent uh, to use my data in any possible manner during these experiments which is of course very problematic. Yeah, particularly, actually, uh, particularly when, when you list change. If you look at the fact that you sign up for these license agreements, the first thing that you see at the bottom says, we can change it without notifying you. I mean, I think that's, uh, I was actually going to ask Jeremy during your talk, you know, does your organization work on you list? Because people are not lawyers. So, so there was actually the project, it's, it's not currently an active EFF project, and I actually don't know the status off the top of my head. There was a, a project called Tossback, terms of service back, which would uh, both, I think, monitor terms of service for changes, but also try to distill it down into an actual something a normal human could understand. Uh, but I don't know off the top of my head what the status of that is. Okay, so next question. I was quite a bit surprised by that advice uh, to do something good with the data. I think uh, you never know what you're doing with the data. Shouldn't the advice be something like, do something that you can tell everybody, and if your company forbids to tell everybody, don't do it. So it's Eric Schmidt's comment, right, that you shouldn't do anything, or all the things that you do. Um, you should only do things that you would be able to share with others. Well, I give you an example, I give you an example. Um, the exact quote is, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. <laughs> I, I, it was a question I had in my, <laughs> in my drawer, so I have the exact quote. I'll give you an example. Um, there are um, satellites... So, sorry, this was a sentence stayed, said by a CEO of an important IT company that we all know. But, okay, please, so please go on. Yeah. There are satellites um, flying around the Earth since about, well, over 10 years now, CHAMP is the project. CHAMP measure, measures uh, how much water is under the soil. And um, so you know um, where water is disappearing. This is scientific data. Um, people, of course, want to know where the water is disappearing because uh, tomorrow they can't live there. But on the other hand, uh, people want to know it because um, then uh, um, uh, the ground becomes cheap or uh, expensive at, uh, well, the one or the other place. So um, there's big, big money behind that. And um, this data is kept um, secret, at least partly, um, because of, right, because of that. So, well, a difficult question. Data isn't 
bad or evil and you can do everything with it, you know? Well, I think that's the point though, isn't it? It's not that the data is evil. It's that we have a responsibility to use it responsibly. Okay, any other comment or remark? One and two. Thank you. I think what worries me about all this, and this last comment I think ties into that, is that, you know, you can say what computer scientists should do. You can say they should do the right thing with data. But it seems to me so much of this is about large corporations. And I think, you know, that's why we've heard advocated multiple times today the need for policy decisions. But I think what worries me is that I can't really imagine what the policy would look like given what's already gone on, say, in the world of advertising. Like in the US, you know, it's supposed to be the industry's gonna self-regulate. That's been a complete disaster. Um, so I guess I just wonder how much um, policy can do and, and, or how much will be put forth that can actually have an effect on these huge corporations. Let me only make a remark that it's not only a matter of, corpor of big corporations, but also big, of big states. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it's the yeah. two big governments, yes. I mean, okay, so maybe, so the, the, I, I would translate it saying, I mean, what can be done in terms of policy? How, is, how, how much is policy advanced? So maybe, Alessandro, you have some idea or more Peter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can jump in. So, so uh, I think, uh, at least from EFF's perspective, the policy solution has, uh, at least in the US, more or less failed. Uh, we have no hope at this point, which is why we're switching to uh, technology-based solutions. Uh, uh, and it would be great if we could have a policy solution. Uh, don't get me wrong, I would prefer that in an instant because it would protect everyone uh, instead of just the people who are technically savvy enough to uh, adjust their browser settings or install an extension or, you know, monitor and, and be aware of what they're sharing. Uh, but at some level, we have to, we have to push uh, at whatever, uh, you know, pressure points we can find. Uh, and so that's, it's the best we can do, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and, and my challenge was due to the fact that I, I do agree in, uh, um, with Jeremy about technological solutions, but uh, I also don't believe that they will come out from the, from, from, from the market space. Uh, in the sense that technolo the technology themselves, yes. Uh, industry labs and academic labs have produced in the last 20 to 30 years a, a more privacy preserving equivalent for pretty much any electronic transaction we can think of. We have uh, privacy protective, uh, protected email, uh, we have privacy, we have anonymous payments, uh, we have, uh, as oxymoronic as it may sound, we have uh, privacy enhancing collaborative filtering, uh, and the problem is actually deploy them. And that's why we go into this catch-22 or chicken and, egg, the chicken and egg discussion of how can we use policy to help the technology being deployed. The technology exists, but it's not being used, at least not being used uh, um, on, a, on a wide scale. Peter? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think one of the conclusions we had is that the solution to, for example, the mass surveillance or the security, uh, security of the internet it's, it's not going to be purely technical, it's not going to be purely social or, or policy. It's going to have to be a combination of those. Um, and maybe we as technologies, I mean, one of the things, like you, you were hinting at that, maybe we can apply on pressure points. I mean, it's slightly frivolous at the moment, it's occurred to me that if we as a, you know, the crypto security community got together and threatened to Obama or so the US administration, that we will work like hell to deploy completely unbreakable end-to-end -end crypto if you don't do something to clean up your act. Yeah, that, that's, that's extreme, but that's maybe one example of a kind of pressure point where yeah. if we as scientists engage and really make the point that we may get some reaction and change in policy and law and stuff. But I, mean, I think we have to emphasize the solution is gonna be a combination of. Yeah, uh, I, I understand from your workshop that there's a lot of things that these guys and girls can do in terms of, you know, for example, these zero knowledge proofs and all the 
uh, technological tools necessary to enforce uh, better encryption. I mean, there, there's a lot of things. It's not only a matter of politicians. You cannot just sit there and <laughs> leave it to the politicians. It's but again, a to quote Ron Rives' uh, <laughs> joke theorem, you can do anything with modern crypto. So yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe we can even change policy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Any other comment? Okay, two here in front. Hello. Um, this is something similar to what the lady was saying, but. So we've been talking about corporations and things, and Google is wonderful. You know, you give them your information, but you get search and you get email and all these wonderful things that we're happy to give away. And I was talking to my friend the other week, and why aren't governments doing this? Are they truly terrified of what it would be if, oh, we know the location of our citizens so we can better provision what parks need to be fixed or the potholes that appear? And I was just wondering, like, are people terrified for policy? Are we, because of what the NSA happened, we're not going to touch that barge pole? Or we don't want the government to know all these things about us? And, you know, just we give this stuff away to companies for free, but governments are supposed to take care of us. So, you know, what if they were to do this too and the benefits that would come from it? It's interesting that you mention that because in New York City, there's a system called 311 where somebody can actually dial. They see a pothole, they see a problem, they see a broken pipe, they see a fire hydrant that's not working properly. They call the local government official. They have a hotline in New York City for, for this uh, problem to be fixed. And so uh, that works very well and the citizens are quite happy with it, right? Um, but I do think that as a private citizen, I don't trust the NSA. <laughs> and, um, so I, I think there has to be, I mean, one of the ways that New York accomplished this actually was, they, it was with the promise that we wanted to make uh, living in New York City better. And we want you to participate in it. It's literally a crowdsourced opportunity for people to go in and, and help their city be improved. Um, and I think there are ways that we could do that, but maybe it's, it's to come from the bottom up. Maybe at the city level for some cases, maybe we work to the county, maybe work to the state level before we start thinking about it at the federal level. Might, might make it a little bit easier for people to accept. Well, uh, I have a comment starting with and then a question. So I'm actually working on a big data problem. So it was mentioned many times. Uh, the physics problem, I'm working on the trigger system of the Atlas detector. It's a big data problem of the size of 80 terabytes per second. But this is a beautiful big data problem in the sense that there is no moral question there. It's just beautiful science. So we know how to sample our data there. It's clear. It's crystal clear. So this huge amount of data that's being monitored, how is it actually sampled? I mean, y you mentioned the sampling bias. What's the sampling bias there? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that all this cannot be stored. So how is it sampled and how is it chosen? Uh, so I'll give, I'll give a, a, a slightly different example of, of where you can come up with sampling bias. So say you wanted to uh, improve uh, the highway system in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and to do that, you need to know where the cars are driving. So there's, uh, to get across the bridges, because of course you've got to get across the bay, uh, there are these toll systems where you have this little RFID tag that sits in your windshield. And so you might think that one way to do this is to just record, you can, each RFID tag's unique, you just put sensors all over the highways, not just on the bridge, so you can tell where people are. And you may even anonymize it, uh, but you get a good, you think you might get a good idea of the, the traffic pattern that way. Uh, the sampling bias is inherent in the fact that to get one of these RFID tags, you need a credit card. And if you're low income, uh, if you don't have good credit, you cannot get one of these tags. And so if you don't think about it, you know, if you don't dive into it and think about the provenance of the data, you end up saying, this is where the traffic is for all of the rich people. And so you end up fixing the traffic for all the rich people. So that's just one example. I mean, there's, you, it, the bias always depends on the particular scenario. Uh, and so that's, does that answer your question in terms of where bias can come up? Yeah, I, I guess to, 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 pick on, to continue on along this line, in the, in the, in the pure physical experiment case, uh, you, you design the, the sampling rate. Yes. You, you decide which data point you include uh, and record on the basis of criteria that are scientific in nature. Here you have two additional complexities. The first one is that you have the human in the loop. And the human is on board or outside of your system, depending on a bunch of other correlates and a bunch of other features that you only know partially and you only know them for the people who are in your system. 
And so by definition, you have a, uh, a perspective on the system which is sort of historical, constrained. You know, if, if this was physics, computational social science would be a cosmology. You, you, you can only look at the past, uh, you cannot change your perspective, you're stuck on her, and, uh, and, and you're only looking at, you know, you only have historical records, you cannot replay the system, you cannot do controlled experiments, which you have the luxury of doing uh, in, uh, in physics, right, in, in, many, in many cases. Here you cannot just restart the, the entire transportation system on New York with a new rule to see how things would go in that way. You can do A-B testing, you can segment things sometimes, uh, or you can introduce interventions and see how things uh, evolve. But, but you got one instance of the system and you got humans in the loop, which is why it's important to know about human factor, behavioral economics, uh, and a lot of other things that do not factor in as simply computer science nowadays. So the fact that we speak about computational social science already conflates the social aspect uh, and the computational one, but that's just the beginning. What we are seeing here is the computational social science plus regulation plus the feedback on the system that the regulation entails. And this, this again uh, has got all of the complexity that we have come to face in uh, thinking about public health, for example, where you can use data at scale about the system in order to nudge behavior, to influence behavior, try to convince smokers not to smoke, try to manage risk at scale. Except that now we can, uh, we can have this population perspective while at the same time we can target you down to the individual. We, we have the very fine resolution of measurement and intervention capability. And, and, and this opens up a bunch of new challenges, which I think can be very positively inspired by what the, the communities of, again, biomedical sciences and public health in particular have been, uh, have been developing because they, from the start, uh, they had in the culture the fact that they're dealing with humans. And, and they've been regulated and they've come with regulations uh, in order to do so effectively while achieving scientific impact uh, and retaining uh, full protection of the rights of citizens. So I don't know if this answers this, but this is roughly my, my, my take on this. One question there and one at the bottom. Uh, one of the reasons that I think uh, we're not doing a lot of good with, with data is that there's a good reason for uh, people to mistrust organizations who, uh, who have control of their data. It seems like um, uh, hackers are so much ahead of the game that, and organizations are not doing a good job of protecting the data they're entrusted with. What can this group do to um, ensure that proper security is done? Because I think, for example, in public health, uh, I for one would be much happier uh, allowing my medical records to be in the hands of, uh, of a hospital uh, if I knew that they were going to safeguard it. I mean, I think transparency is key here. And, and I think one of the ways that in, in your specific example, I also would feel a lot more secure sharing my data with a hospital if they had a website that I could go to that described their security mechanisms and the ways in which they were going to ensure that they kept my data secure. And I think that that's something, this sort of ties into this idea of is it individual action or policy or I think culturally establishing that norm creating more and more people who request that information and pursue it um, is, is one of the many ways that we can start to tackle this problem. Because I think transparency is one of the best ways to feel better and, and be able to trust more who has our data. Um, if I can offer a data point that I believe supports both of your uh, statements. We, we, we just finished and we are on the way to publishing Management Science, a study related to the impact of privacy regulation on HIEs, health information exchanges. In the United States, these HIEs are organizations which try to facilitate uh, the sharing of uh, uh, medical data, medical records across institutions such as hospitals, insurance, and so forth. Now, typically in the economic literature, the debate on privacy regulation is that regulation of privacy decreases technological innovation because it creates obstacles to entrepreneurs and therefore decreases their incentives to innovate. We find that the opposite, at least in this context. We find that the more protected the regulation is in a certain state, 
the more keen people are to actually share their data with uh, um, hospitals or other enti entities in, in the sector. And therefore, the, the, the more innovation we have in the, in the area of HIE. So actually, stronger protection can sometimes be correlated or potentially causally connected to uh, faster innovation. Very well. Any other comment? Uh, well, I can throw in something. Uh, I mean, that's a very nice point, and in fact, in, in Luxembourg, we have a project going on with the Luxembourg Centre for System Biology, and so they have large data banks, and they're, for example, following a, a cohort of people um, who either have or potentially will have Parkinson's and stuff, and one of the things we're aiming to do is put more transparency into uh, the mechanisms for storing the data and um, distributing the data so the patients themselves can see you know, what's happening to their data, perhaps in some instances give consent if necessary, and so on. And the hope is that this will encourage more patients to, to give up because, of course, they have to sign consents for their data to be put on these databases anyway. So the hope is that you know, by adding this kind of transparency and accountability, that th this will help. And actually, accountability is a key word which came up in, in our discussion, that um, we'll never have sort of absolute security and absolute secrecy um, but maybe if we can at least achieve a greater degree of account accountability, that is maybe a somewhat more achievable goal. And so I think th throughout this, uh, the notion of accountability I is a crucial one. Um. Also in the, in the computer science community, especially at MIT, as far as I'm aware, there's an ongoing uh, push for the creation of uh, personal data stores, software toolkits that are open and widely deployed and that allow citizens to, to act as a safe for their digital persona, for their digital identity, and grant specific rights to third parties under specific conditions, expose specific features and revoke these rights. Of course, as you imagine, I mean, there, is, there are technical uh, challenges to be overcome there, but I think that technically a lot can be done that enables uh, uh, society to, to create also bottom-up attempts at solving these problems and then, uh, then of course it depends on adoption, it depends on, on standards uh, and, uh, and again on how they, they enter the, the ecosystem of information. Okay, so we are heading towards the end of the session, so don't be shy. One and two. So I feel uh, we are approaching the problem more qualitatively, like on one end we get the picture that um, we'll be saving people from floods, we'll be saving people um, he helping their lives. On the other end, we get the picture that, oh, uh, or uh, also like there will be no terrorism if NSA gets access to the data. On the other end, we get the picture that, oh, my SSN is going to be uh, known to everyone. Uh, all the advertisers know, you know, what I do in my personal life. Um, Shouldn't we try to approach it more like a quantitative, like what am I losing every day? What am I gaining every day? I, I sort of want to know more the numbers, not the two extreme cases that can happen because there are a lot of extreme possibilities every day in every action we take, but we sort of do things when we know that w what is the expected value I'll be getting out. So are there any works on getting more quantitative information uh, about this? What are we losing? What are we gaining? Not just the extreme cases. I guess one way, uh, probably Alessandro, you, you can have a better take on this, but I guess that one way to um, reason about this is to start reasoning about what it means uh, to define a price for a given piece of information to be protected or shared. In a sense when in many situations, uh, like for example insurances, you are sharing some information in exchange for, uh, for a discount on the service. And this is a value exchange where you're putting a price on a piece of information. And there was a recent, um, uh, in, in May 2000, in May this year, May 2015, there was a very interesting article published in the Harvard uh, Business Review where they were reporting the result of a study when across several cultures, I think this was United States, China, India, uh, the UK and Germany, they were asking uh, a cohort of people, um, uh, I, don't, I, I don't remember details on representativeness, they were asking cohorts of people to answer the question, uh, how much data would you pay to protect this type of information? Asking them to disaggregate uh, personal information, um, financial information, health information, um, personal preferences, and so on and so forth, communication patterns. 
And, and you can see that there are very dramatically different patterns in, uh, across different uh, uh, societies uh, that reflect different values, different sensibilities, but also different priorities for problems in this Maslow pyramid, right? And, 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 and I think this ties into what, and, and is part of a, of a solution to what you're saying. We need to study that in order to, to start uh, reasoning about what it means to define uh, a price for sharing information. But uh, as you imagine, at the same time, this comes with the risk of creating new divides uh, uh, where, and, and creating instabilities where suddenly data protection and privacy become uh, uh, an asset for people who can afford to, to buy the, the retention of, in, in full of their data. Yeah, I think you know something about <laughs> how so, to put monetize. Well, your, your question is, is beautiful, and I, I cannot conceivably give it justice in just two minutes, but just a few pointers. Uh, one, um, because your question is beautiful and incredibly difficult for, for scholars as well to address, typically I try to separate, split two questions. One is the positive, uh, 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 I will draw a difference between a positive argument and a normative argument, right? A, 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 an argument about how the world is and how the world should be. So in, uh, in normative terms, there is a question, should we protect privacy? Uh, that you may try to address maybe using quantitative methods, such as uh, you, tr you, you try to calculate the costs and the benefits of sharing and protecting, and, the, uh, and eventually you find an answer. It's either a plus or a minus that tells you I should reveal more, I should protect more. Then there is another question, which is uh, let's assume that privacy should be protected, okay? Let's pause it. How do we do that? Is uh, the marketplace alone sufficient in guaranteeing that degree of protection? Can consumers, through informed consent, achieve that degree of protection? Okay? So we try to split the two questions so as not to contaminate the challenges of addressing the first into trying to address the latter. Now, for the first, there is an enormous literature. By this, I do not mean at all that the question has been answered, because the literature, literature is very complex, and after, in the break, I'm happy to discuss that with you. I will simply point out a couple of things. I could start saying things such as, well, you know, the cost of privacy often come in two flavors. Uh, very low probability events with huge, huge cost. The Ashley Madison suicide, right? Uh, already three people apparently committed suicide because of the data breach. Very low probability event, very, very, interrupt. very bad. The Ashley Madison thing is, was a hacking that on a, web, a dating website or something A like very this. particular kind of dating website. <laughs> <laughs> so a, a website for people who want to cheat. Uh, um, their partners, yeah. yeah. Their partners, their married partners. Um, and then there are very high frequency events with very low cost. Spam, uh, the advertising that you don't like and create an obstruction or in fact uh, slows down uh, your, your browsing on the internet and so forth. But more important than that, because we, we can have the discussion uh, offline, more important than that is the following point. Economists, as economists, we are good at studying what we can measure. But I believe that much of the interesting part with, with, with privacy is uh, economic dark matter. We know it's there, we cannot really measure it. Uh, because uh, much of the implications of sharing and protecting data are long term, are very complex, are things such as how, do, how does the sharing of my data affect my autonomy or my freedom? Things which are not easy for economists to capture. In fact, I would even argue as an economist that we don't want economists to, to, to try to quantify them. <laughs> okay. So we have time for a couple more questions. There was one here. Anybody else? Okay. Let's say three. One, two, three, and that's it. So for me, one of the important questions uh, is about the asymmetry of the relation. So as a matter of fact, we have uh, enterprises that have uh, access to data while uh, if I want to have access to data, it's really difficult. Uh, I will make some examples. In, this, in the last years, there, have, there has been some geotagging movements of people that go around tagging special places. Or uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it happened to me, I was in a supermarket keeping track of the prices of the products and uh, writing them down to compare them with other supermarkets. And I was forced to, forced to, give, back my, to give my block notes because it was forbidden to to take it, to write down the prices of the super, of the supermarket, or as a matter of fact, like uh, in a real estate market in uh, where I live in Rio de Janeiro, you always know the price that is uh, 
for which they want to sell, but you never know the price at which uh, it is sold. So as a matter of fact, all this data would be really nice, or would be really useful for me to navigate in the world, but I don't have access to them. So, and uh, at the same time, it seems like the policies that are produced by governments are going for, uh, towards data retaining in this direction and data openness in the other direction. So do you have any opinion on this? Anybody wants to comment? If you want, yeah. Um, so um, you may know there was a paper, uh, one of the seminar papers in the field of privacy um, uh, was by Warren and Brandeis, 1890 or 1891, Harvard Law Review, the right of, uh, the right of privacy, okay? They, they were talking about the importance of individual privacy. But in fact, Brandeis, who at the time was a, a, a just a, an attorney in Boston, uh, later became a Supreme Court justice in the United States and wrote another piece later on in his career about the need for transparency of governments. So there is, you hit on something, an issue very, very important. We have this asymmetry where more and more of the internet are making individuals, people transparent to states and industry, but we don't have the, the, a, a, a reciprocal transparency in terms of what industry does with the data or what governments do with the data. I really would like to reframe the debate so that if we are expected to, and we are told that the sharing of our data uh, will, uh, will be better for us, I would say we should impose the same degree of transparency to industry or governments. Uh, they should show more about how they operate inside, in particular how they use uh, our data. It's not only the transparency on how they operate, it's also about their data. Because like, uh, I would like, uh, after the financial crisis, as a matter of fact, I would like to understand if, uh, how the budgets of, uh, of enterprise have changed or uh, the budgets of bank have changed and okay. I don't know anything. Yeah. Okay, so let us um, do the last two questions together, one after another, and then we will do a last round and, uh, and we will close. Mine is not a question really, but a kind of comment with respect to uh, the issue of transparency on, on the side of the people that keep the data of these uh, small and medium scale enterprises. What I want to suggest is there is need for security auditing mechanism, which this SME can use to audit the security mechanism claimed by those that keep their data. Because at times you discover that many of the mechanisms they claim to have, they don't really have them. And then secondly, I also want to uh, comment on the issue of uh, policy on the side of the consumer. Because when you subscribe to some of these social media and then you are to agree the license terms, you discover that you just have to click on. There is no uh, forum or uh, opportunity to negotiate what you want to be done to your data after all. Mm -hmm. These are my comments. Thanks. Then the last question. Yeah, so you've spent a lot of time talking about the ethics that come into big data and questions associated with that. But I want to ask a question about math. So each of you as a researcher has to deal with some sort of algorithms and math and I guess sometimes you 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 hear about something and you think oh that's really cool like zero knowledge. But as, as I understand zero knowledge is not exactly the most uh, efficient uh, in practice. Not Well not yet anyway. So I would want to ask you, obviously you cannot go into detail right now in two minutes, but could you name a couple of abstract mathematical ideas that you would have wanted to use in your research, but you can't right now because they're not developed enough to apply them in real life? Thanks. Maybe. Well, I suppose one obvious thing would be a really efficient, homom fully homomorphic uh, crypto algorithm which would potentially allow you to you know, do computations on data while it's still under uh, encrypted. If we could currently, I mean, we have highly inefficient schemes. Uh, eventually, maybe we'll have ones which are sufficiently uh, uh, e efficient to be practical, and that would certainly help with quite a lot of these issues. But that's the first one which springs to my mind. Uh, zero knowledge proofs, well, certainly in the context of sort of cryptographic protocols, are actually quite, quite efficient. But uh, I don't, okay. yeah, but. No, no, please. 
well, I was just going to say, I mean, the idea of trying to use them to, in some sense, uh, monitor that uh, intelligence agencies are following rules, but in a way which you know, doesn't reveal too much, how you would actually apply that is still a very hypothetical. And that, that's a much more complex problem than just are you obeying the rules of a cryptographic protocol. But you know, that's a, a big research issue, I think. OK, so if there are no more remarks, I would uh, stop with this. So a uh, message to you that there's really a lot of things that you can do. And I hope, I mean, the secret agenda of this event from my side was to having you going away with the wish to do something and maybe a couple of ideas of what you can do as young scientists. So let us thanks, thank our speakers and thank you and thank the Heidelberg Laureate Forum for allowing this. Thank you.